In this tutorial, we're going to look at how the hands of the watch were created. So we have this white hand here, we have these blue hands, and also the center top part. This is what we're going to discuss and how these were created. Now in batch, you'll see I've already brought in a still image of what the hands will look like in the end. We'll use this as a reference as we draw the different shapes and create the different shapes in the action tool. So let's add our action tool and feed that in as our background for the action tool. Hold shift and kiss the nodes together to do that. So now in action and the end result, we see our background, which is our reference image. Let's go to the schematic view and start creating the 3D shapes that we need. So in the schematic, let's bring in our first 3D shape that we're gonna use. Let's go back to our F4 result view. Let's zoom in so we have a good close view of our reference. And we'll start with this hand over here in the upper right corner. So just start clicking and drawing your shape inside of the viewport. Just for reference for the mask, the auto tangent option is off. So that is why I can now just click and create corner points and draw my shape. Obviously, if I need tangents, if I want to have the handles, I would click and drag. But for this shape, obviously, I do not need that. So I'll just go along and then close this mask. As we did before, we want to adjust the transparency of the mask so we can see through it. Go to the geometry and increase the transparency to about 30 or so. So now we can see through and we can see our reference image. So to do that, let's go back to our schematic. Let's select our three shape. And then from our node bin, let's drag another G mask and it will be automatically attached to this 3D shape. Go back to the end result and let's continue drawing out our shapes. So now we'll draw this mask that's going to be the hole. It's gonna punch a hole through our shape. Once you've finished creating that shape, Go to the spline settings for our shape and make sure you turn hole on so this will punch a hole through the other mask. Now let's add another G mask to this shape. So go back to your schematic, select the 3D shape, go back to the node bin for action and drag another G mask into the schematic. Go back to our end result and as we did before, create the shape by clicking and drawing around our reference. Once again, from the object spline controls for this G mask, enable the whole option. So now for the other parts of the hands, we're just going to start adding more 3D shapes and go along and draw the shapes as needed. If you want to see the background image, you can just hit F2 to look at the background and then always hit F4 to go back to looking at the end result. We'll go through the process of adding more masks to our 3D geometry. So again, with the 3D shape selected, we add another G mask. And don't forget to go to your spline settings for this mask and enable the whole option. So I've jumped ahead in the process to where all of the G masks for the individual 3D shapes have been created. Each part has been drawn, each part has been added, and all the transparency settings have been set back to zero. So there is no transparency except for the ones where we actually punched holes through for the purpose of creating a hole inside of our geometry. Now is the time to start extruding and finalizing the actual shapes of all these different arms and hands and elements that are part of the watch. So if I go back to the schematic view and as I pan over, you can see each one of them has been created. Each individual part of the hands has been created. But now we want to add an axis that's going to be the master axis or the parent to everything. So I'll drag an axis into my schematic. I'll hold the shift key and I'll go along and kiss this new axis to each one of the main axes for the individual 3D shapes. Now going back to our end result with that axis selected, we can rotate it and you can see how all of them will interact with the adjustments that we're making. 
We're done with our background image, so let's go to the Media tab and let's turn the back off. So now we need to start to extrude each part of our geometry. So let's hit the tilde key to go back to our schematic view for action. You can select this 3D shape of this first one. You'll see that is the one that is selected right there. We have icons on. So this is the 3D shape that is selected, the first one that I drew. Go to the object controls and we want to be on the basic control. So we want to give a depth value to the extrusion. For the hands, we're going to do a depth value of 10. The default is to have the extrusion come from the center point, and that's not what I want. I want to have it actually extruding from its creation point. So go back down to your basic settings and switch it from center to front. Once again, let's enable the shading option for our scene. So go to Node Preferences, the Rendering tab, Activate Shading, and set it to 100%. Now we can select our geometry directly here in the viewport instead of having to go back to the schematic every time. So for example, I can just click and select this shape right here. And then we can go back to our object controls and our basic controls for this 3D geometry and set it to front and then give it a value of 10 for its depth for the extrusion. Now I'm gonna go through and do that to each one of the parts that make up the actual hands. Each one of them I will set it to front, and each one I will set the extrusion to 10. Now the center object, we want to give it a little more of an extrusion, so select it in your viewport. You can see it there it is now highlighted. Let's give this a depth value of 30, and again switch it to front. So we've got one more tiny handle in the back here we forgot. Let's select that and give that extrusion depth of 10, and make sure it is set to front also. Let's go back to our schematic and quickly select our main parent axis. Then back in the result view. Now we can rotate it and we can see exactly what we've created. Now we want to start adjusting our profile values for each one of them. And all of these are going to be the same, so we'll do this quickly. I'll select this G mask right here, the first one right down here. Then we'll go to our object profile settings and we'll set our curvature to one. And we can zoom in so we can see exactly what's happening. And then we're going to set our angle profile to 20. Now I'll go through and do the same settings for each one of the parts, the pieces that make up the hands. For the center one, we can make some different adjustments to it because it's a larger piece. So once again, I'll select that G mask and we'll put the curvature to one. We want that the same. If I enter the value of 20, that would match everything else. But because this is actually a different piece, very separate from the other elements that are all that's supposed to be the same, we can decrease the angle on this to give it a little different look. Maybe take it down to about six or so. Now, as you were modeling or as you were creating all of these, if all of a sudden you look and you see one of your arms or you see a part of it where you're not punching the hole through it, it's because you didn't turn hole on. And if you look at the back top, arm right here, you'll notice I'm, I'm not seeing the hole through it. With this selected, you see I have it selected now, if we look down at my spline settings, I do not have the hole option. So if you see anything like this, double check and make sure you have the hole option set for that individual mask that is punching a hole through another mask. The next stop in this tutorial would be to start adding our materials to the different elements that we just modeled. And again, since we've done this multiple times in some of the previous videos, we're going to fast forward through what we've already learned. And that is adding a substance PBR to the 3D model, going and changing the color of the substance PBR, maybe adjusting some of the settings such as the rust or the dirt or the imperfections. And we're also going to add an IBL, an, an image-based lighting, to our camera, and we're going to change the image that's being used for the IBL. We're also going to create a caustic effect outside in batch, which we're then going to feed in as a layer, and then use that as a reflection map on the different elements that we want to have the reflection map applied to. Again, all of this has been covered, so let's jump forward to where we're going to look at something new. Now, for the front part of the arms, or the hands, we're not going to put a P substance PBR on. We're just going to change the color of the geometry. So if I click and select the G mask in the viewport here for this front part right here, now going back to the schematic view, we can see that this is the one that is selected. So we just select the 3D shape right there, go to the geometry tab for this. I'll go to the end result view again, and I'll just click on the color pot for the diffuse, which is white currently. 
and I'll choose a bright blue and click OK. You could apply any of the many substance PBRs, substance textures, and so on to this, but we're just going to be changing the color of it, keeping it simple. Let me come over to this other hand right here, and I'm going to select its G mask. Hit the tilde key to go back to our schematic, and again, we can see which one is highlighted. Make sure you select the 3D shape that is part of this, and then again, go to the diffuse pot and change this one also to that same bright blue color. So now if we go back to our schematic and we select our main axis, we can go back to our result view and we can rotate and see how our object is looking. Let's add an additional light to the scene to help light it. So go back to the schematic. Let's just drag a light and go back to our end result. You can see how we're illuminating these objects now with our new light. For the light settings, let's go and set the light type to an ambient light. And then we can start to decrease the intensity. Let's add one more light, an additional one. So go back to our schematic, hit the L key and drag a light into the schematic. Hit F4 to go back to our end result again. And this light can be a point spotlight. The default, we'll leave that alone. Now let's position this way off on the X on one side of it. So I can start dragging this to the right. This will give us some highlights along the very edge. And again, you can adjust the intensity to your liking. Let's go back to the end result once again, because I want to now just point out, if you look here, we see these reflections and the, and the shadows that are happening on these different elements that we just created. So let's go back to our action setup. Let's select our camera. Down in our node bin then, hit the matchbox bin and hit the S key. Add a Stingray ambient inclusion to your camera. And with the camera still selected, at a Stingray depth of field. The camera wasn't actually selected, so connect the camera to, to the Stingray depth of field. Then add a Stingray reflection. So now all three of these are applied to our camera. Select the main axis that's controlling everything, and then let's go to our end result, hitting F4. Now we'll zoom in a little bit, and as we rotate our object, you can see the reflections taking place. Let's go to a two layout, a two view layout. So hold the Alt key and hit the two key. So we've got our end result on the right and our action schematic on the left. And then in our result view, we're gonna zoom in. We're gonna zoom in on our object so we can see it clearly. And then over here in the action schematic, let's move over so we can access the three different matchbox that we've applied to our camera. And then select the Stingray ambient inclusion and hit the H key to hide it and unhide it to, to see the effect that is happening to our geometry because of the Stingray ambient inclusion. And then I can select the Stingray reflection and do the same thing. Hit the H key to hide and unhide the reflections and we can see exactly what is happening. Go back and select our main axis and then you can rotate the shape. You can see the reflections are updating in real time as we rotate. Let's go back to a one view layout and I'll make sure that in my schematic I have the depth of field, uh, the Stingray depth of field node selected, and then we'll go back to our end result in the one view. And then from the parameters for this depth of field, we can adjust the range if you wanted to. You can narrow it or make it wider. Let me go back and select the main axis for everything. And then as I start to adjust this in Z position, you will see how parts of it are being blurred, parts are being focused. This is all based on the settings of your Stingray depth of field applied to your camera. Let me go back and select our depth of field node once again. And now as we make adjustments to different parameters, we see it affecting our geometry. Change things such as the near max, increasing the amount to a higher value. You can also adjust the near distance amount. This is going to change the depth of field, obviously. And then we can go back to a two view layout once again, after we've made these adjustments and we can select that Stingray depth of field and then hit the H key like we were doing earlier and you can see the end result as we hide and unhide the depth of field. I can go back and select our main axis once again, go back to a one view, the end result. And as I rotate this, you can see how the camera effects, the, the Stingray depth of field, ambient inclusion, and reflections are all interacting together on our geometry. So that's going to wrap up this video, this tutorial.